Hey guys, thanks for coming. So today we're going to be talking about the new charter school uh, called ACE, which focuses on kids on the spectrum uh, with autism. I think uh, ACE stands for Academy Collaborative Education. Maddie, Joellen, thank you so much for um, uh, being willing to come on and just uh, share your experience and talk to us a little bit about this school. I attended a, an event yesterday with the Monroe Chamber of Commerce and uh, that event was uh, talking about nothing but education. We had Superintendent Monroe, Superintendent for West um, Monroe City, then Washtenaw Parish. We had the mayor, and then we had Ashley Ellis, which is a Bessie board member. And at the end of that meeting, I, as I mentioned to you guys earlier, they uh, uh, Ashley uh, spoke about this school you guys have um, finally got approval for, for a charter school for ACE. What, what's the name of the school? Academy of Collaborative Education. Okay. ACE. ACE. Mm -hmm. So ACE is now supported by the state of Louisiana. And so, guys, so we have Maddie. Maddie, and how long have you been uh, pushing this? Uh, we've been working on this for almost three years. So Maddie and Miss uh, Joellen. Mm -hmm. So you said three years working on this? Just about. How did you guys, how did you guys meet? Would you like to say? I will. Um, I work for early intervention. I'm a speech therapist. Um, it's my day job. And um, I met the Cannons um, through early intervention. I'm a speech therapist. And her son, Ace, was recently at that time diagnosed. Um, he was right at two years old. Okay. And so I became their speech therapist. And um, we worked so well together, and I just love her family, and she allowed me to come in her home every every week and teach Ace, you know, how to communicate and how to use his voice in their family, even as to, at two years old. He was nonverbal at the time. So with Ace being uh, two years old, is Ace your only child, or? I have three children. Three children. Yes, Ace is my middle. Okay. And he was nonverbal very frustrated as a mom with they were um, they're two years apart so I have now or at the time a, basically a newborn a two-year-old and a four-year-old and I have this one that's been diagnosed on the spectrum and it's like what do we do where do we go what what can we do to make it better now when you um, said the word the spectrum um, I find that to be um, um, very broad yeah, it's, it's really broad. So trying to prepare for this and doing, doing some research, when you say spectrum, I mean, it is extremely broad. It is from, uh, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, it's from very high functioning that people may not even know that you have mm -hmm. uh, autism or on the spectrum to we have some that is just very debilitating and that it's uh, very difficult for them to function in society. Is that, would that be a true statement when you look at the whole spectrum? Yes. Absolutely. I like to say when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with okay. autism. I think that's a that's a great explanation of it. No two people are the same, just like no two days are the same for our kids. Okay. So you come into the house and from a therapy standpoint, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we have a family that is concerned at that point. We don't know what to do. We bring a professional in. And talk to me about that process of bringing in a professional and try to help your family. Because I would think that part of your job is not just helping ACE, but it's probably helping the family to, to be able to cope with or to teach them how to uh, better communicate. Yes, that's what early intervention in Louisiana is about, early steps, is about going into the home or to a daycare, wherever the child is in their natural environment. And we do a lot of therapy with the child, but also with the family to help them integrate all the strategies and interventions that help them when I'm not there. So I am I am a professional and I, I do my thing in therapy. I'm doing my thing. But that doesn't help the family or the daycare provider after I'm gone because right. I don't come back till next week. So helping the family um, know what to do, how to help him communicate, how to him to identify what his needs and wants are, it's a, jank, a game changer. That was huge for us mm -hmm. because we had been doing therapies ever since he had been nine months old. We didn't know what diagnosis or what was going on, honestly, but we just knew something wasn't 
wasn't clicking for him. And so we had done different speech, occupational therapy, and we continued to do outpatient therapy, but it was a matter of what more can we do? And that's when Joellen came in to give me techniques. And then I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even think of that. That's a great way to look at it. So of course she taught us the, the PEC system, which is a picture system, which allowed him to you know, go to it to touch if he wanted something or to ask for something, which it took us a while to get there, mm-hmm. right. but it was a start. Or if he was having a meltdown, she helped us try to figure what out, what to do mm-hmm. in that case to help minimize his frustrations. Because every child is different, right? Every child is different. Yes. Wow. So uh, how old is Ace now? He's eight. So Ace is eight. So it's been a five-year process from the time you guys got together until where we're at today. Got right. what it Pretty sounds much. like, right? Yes, sir. So in that five years, at what point did you say that, you know what, we need to take this to the next level because we have something special here that more parents need to be able to take advantage of. And I would have to assume that's kind of the genesis, or was it something else that, that decided to put you guys on the path to start this charter school? I reached out to Joe Ellen um, when Ace was in preschool at Highland Elementary okay. in West Monroe. He was in a small classroom with a great teacher, and to this day we still stay in touch. I think she's kind of been the, the ideal teacher for what I wanted and hoped for all the all of Ace's educational years. So both of my kids go to Highland, so I love the school. I'm, we kind of almost feel like we have a little private school setting just <laughs> because it's a, it's it one of the smallest schools that we have in Washington Parish. atmosphere. We loved it there. So in preschool, you're, you're going through preschool with Ace, mm-hmm. and uh, take us from there. Okay, so he did two years. In the first year, COVID happened, and in March, he was still nonverbal, didn't really have any communication skills. I, that's when I reached out to Joellen directly and said, what more can we do? And so since she was at home, basically, because everything was shut down, right. we ended up doing private therapy in her home three days a week. We got an iPad with ProLoquo to go, which is a, cu- a communication app for um, nonverbal kids, adults. And she started working with him on that. And it was like a light bulb went off in him. We had no idea that he knew his letters, colors, shapes, um, all these different things. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Game changer. And literally within a month, his level of frustration just went down tremendously. Mm -hmm. So is there a lot of frustration that is built in in kids and I guess adults, too, that – there's a lot going on in their brain. They just don't know how to communicate it right. where you can understand it. So is, is that where a lot of the frustration comes from? Absolutely. Um, Ace, um, at the time in, in 2020, um, he was a chicken nugget and blueberry eater. And so um, that was the some of the first things that we put on his uh, prolo uh, quote to go. And um, when we figured out he really knew these things, he wow. could chicken nuggets, chicken nuggets, <laughs> And so when he if he touched it, he got it. If he said blueberries, he got it. Now, he was so smart that on the family page, there's a there's different pages on that app. Mm-hmm. And on the family page, he figured out probably about six weeks into it that um, he was getting what he wanted. So he would go to the family page and be mama, mama. <laughs> And that so, meant she, he wanted her to come pick so her he up. So he started really advancing <laughs> yes. himself through the process. Absolutely. Of things. Yeah. Wow. He, By just having that text to speech, it was it was a game changer. It was. And we I, found I just, out how how much he knew. We spent the rest of that summer really figuring out what he knew. So when he went back to pre K four at Highland the next year, they allowed him to, you know, do it again so that he could um, have a full year. Um, it was a game changer in the classroom. Wow. You know, as a parent myself, it's got to be frustrating knowing that you have a, um, a kid that um, is different from the rest. It's kind of a little different from the normal from a communication standpoint. Um, and I also know how frustrating it is when you have that toddler that if you can just tell me what you want, I can make it all better. Mm-hmm. And then you're advancing past that toddler stage and still have a kid that's just not – communicating um, like you and I are communicating here I can imagine the frustration that builds within a family and can also imagine the um, 
relief that comes when you finally hit that point where there's something here Mm -hmm. and we can, I mean, we can do whatever we want because there's a path forward for us. Exactly. So at what point did you guys uh, seriously sit down and say, charter school, let's see if we can make a run at it? Because for many people that, that don't know what a charter school is, can you just give a brief overview of just what a standard charter school is and how it operates? Charter schools in Louisiana are, there are five different categories. Um, our charter school is a type two, which means we had a, sought approval from the Bessie board. So we are our own entity and um, we report directly to them. Some charter schools, there is another school in Baton Rouge called the Emerge, and it is a type one charter school for kids on the autism spectrum. And they are tied to East Baton Rouge Parish. Okay. So they have to negotiate things um, for the success of school. Now, are they mm-hmm. um, aligned with the school board? Do they have over the school board have oversight yes. over them? Yes. Uh, the Washtenaw Parish um, School Board does not have oversight on this. Bessie is, is the authority for this school, right? LDOE. Okay. Louisiana Department of Education. Own, we have our own school board. Okay. So I am the board president, and then we have additional members um, that will oversee the success and accountability accountability of okay. ACE. So we start down in charter school. What year did you, did you guys make the decision that I think that we can benefit more kids in our community? So in January 2021, I reached out to Joellen to try to get a, a game plan because ACE was going to be transitioning to his home school of Claiborne Elementary. Okay. That's where my oldest one has been ever since kindergarten and so that's where he was going to be transitioning to and I, I wanted more for him. I wanted him to have, in my head, a classroom that the setup is at Highland, small, with um, Ms. Zuber uses Mm -hmm. some ABA techniques in there, and that's really what kids on the spectrum need. They need that redirection. They need that constant behavior. Strategies and interventions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To lessen, but also to help them throughout their educational day. And so we got together, and her daughter came and met us for lunch, and it was at Nukes in West Monroe. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a corner booth. We were sitting there talking about different things we could we could try to accomplish. And um, she goes, Mom, why don't y'all just start a school? And we looked at each other, and we're like, what? And she goes, look. And she brought it up, an article on her phone, and said, these two moms in Oregon started a private school for kids on the autism spectrum. Just he gave said, me chill bumps talking about that. And how old was she at the time? Um, oh, gosh. Madison? Thought, yeah. Madison was 22. So 22. So a young adult thinking like a very seasoned adult just giving advice. Mm-hmm. Man, what? I mean, it's just give me chill bumps. I know. And she's she would babysit for me some, and she would keep Ace. So she's been an important part of our family since we've known mm-hmm. Joe Ellen. We developed a really fast friendship through, um, when I was their early steps uh, provider, and, and then afterwards, and of course, COVID hit. So it was when Madison said, you know, look at this, and we read the article uh, quickly. And from there, we contacted those two moms in Oregon, Victory Academy, and they gave us a virtual tour because, of course, everything was still shut sure. down. And so um, we had a virtual tour, and they were they were actually back up and running. They had safety protocols in place for COVID, and they knew that their students on the spectrum, if they're not in school, that um, Internet, you know, Google Classroom, that was not going to be a good fit for them. Right. So they developed protocols very quickly. So we talked with them, we went through what their program was like, and we just started the research from there, and we started visiting other schools. We visited a school in New Orleans that's a private school, and um, we ended up in Arizona at the autism, the Arizona Autism Charter School, ASACS, and um, their founder is also a mom, and uh, they've been uh, in existence for 12 years. This is their 13th year. And uh, we went there, and the things that Maddie and I were thinking needed to be in the classroom for our kids on the spectrum, 
it was actually happening in Arizona. Wow. And it was a such a beautiful thing to watch when we went. Uh, we went for several days, and we were the first uh, people that they had allowed into their school. And um, since that time, actually, uh, Diana Diaz has um, gone on to start a, a foundation so that she can help other uh, people start charter schools for autism across the country. That's amazing. So um, we went and came back, and Ashley helped us, um, introduced us to some other uh, consultants and people that are live in the charter world because it's a it is a different world. Mm-hmm. And so once she introduced us to uh, Chris Myers from New Schools of Baton Rouge, it just took off from there. He um, gifted us uh, a wonderful lady named uh, Kara Majori, and she become, became our touchstone, and she walked us through the process. She walked us through the process all the way to the Bessie meeting. So how hard was the process to, to get a charter school up and running? And the reason I ask that question is um, I know – my only knowledge of charter schools prior to us me looking into this a little bit um, was it it was uh, success but a lot of failure at the same time mismanagement of funds um, the education was just not there the quality was not there for the kids um, what kind of a battle was it to get this thing up off the ground with the charter school system or did y'all just sail through it no, <laughs> we did not sail through it. Um, because of, of what you just described, um, Kara made sure that we put many protocols into place. And the state has actually made the process pretty rigorous. And um, we had another um, set of consultants come on board with us that were specifically special education because that's what our school is, all special education. And so as we went through the process... And Maddie and I knew of the failures in the past. And so we wanted to have multiple checks and balances in place. And that's why we brought on the people on our board that we did, an attorney, uh, someone who's a CFO, someone else who is uh, has a small business, um, moms, and educational, and experts. educational experts. So we want to have those checks and balance. We want to be accountable to our families and to our board and to the state. And we want way. we want ACE to be a model for others. We we want to be that resource and we want to be a model. This can be done. So at what point did you guys start thinking that this is going to be possible? I'm sure at at the uh, onset of it you're like, man, it's a pretty big mountain we got to climb here. Uh process is not going to be easy and it's not going to happen overnight. But when did you when did you finally see the light at the end of the tunnel? to where, holy cow, th- this is going to happen. This is going to be possible. October 10th, 2023. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I was going to so, say the same so thing. <laughs> when Bessie voted on it, right? Yes. Y- you guys were just on pins and needles at that point. Yeah. You just didn't have a level of comfort because it could have went either way. Well, charter schools are not popular in our area. And a specialty school, not exactly popular either. Um, and... You have um, people that don't want charter schools and dissect everything that's on paper. Is it mainly because they don't want to pull funding from the public school system? Mostly. You know, at that uh, conference that the chamber put on yesterday, uh, uh, both superintendents uh, spoke about, you know, the, uh, uh, the student ratio and trying to make sure they have that ratio where it is so they can plan for their budget. So I'm assuming that they're talking about for every kid that's not there, they're not going to get the funding that they need for that school. So with that being said, does funding from the state uh, bypass that school that the kid was on to go for and you guys are able to get that funding? How does fu- how does the funding process work for a charter school? You, yeah. That's how it works. Okay. We, so if we have a child come from Lincoln Parish, we uh, receive their um, money. The, the money follows the, the child. Now, does all of the money follow the child or yes. just some of the money? Because I know that there's going to be federal money, there's going to be state money, and there's going to be local money. Do you, you get all, three. all, so you're able to get all three? Yes. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Which we will need every cent because of the way that we're structured. Those kids deserve it, and we're going to need all of that to ensure that they're given 
a teacher, a para, and an RBT. So how was that celebration when you got word that the vote passed? Well, we were holding hands and just gripping each other. um, And we had parents. I want to take a second to um, acknowledge our parents. Ooh, sorry. It's okay. It was, it was, we had parents come down and really spend the day. Our time of the committee was one o'clock. We did not go in until 515. So we had parents there, um, an aunt, an aunt, a grandmother, and other, we had grandparents there. And they had been there since eleven o'clock that morning. And and kids. They and kids, their, and they and some kids, of them had to bring their so kids. They were so good, but they were. It was beautiful to see the support, and they all n- not a single one of them complained all day. They were like, "We would do it again tomorrow." Wow. And when these parents came to speak on our behalf, to to tell their story, why this school is needed in our community, and. The Bessie members gave them the opportunity to come up and speak, but they stated there was no opposition. There was no need for them to come do that. We were unanimously approved. Wow. And that's not always the case. Well, I mean, that, that I mean, we all know there's a lot of division within politics in general. Mm-hmm. And when you're on the state level, it's just that much more because you got so much more diversity and so many more different opinions to hear that there was nobody that opposed it. Yeah. And we were not Thanks. expecting that. We were expecting some opposition, but we were ready to yeah. answer questions and um, try to, you know, um, set things right. Um, but when he said, you know, does anybody oppose and, and, you know, everybody was like, no. Our parents stood up and cheered in there the meeting. There was not a and single dry eye. I can imagine. Mm-mm. From within our ACE supporters. I can imagine. Oh. So let's talk about So now, uh, October the 10th, celebration happens. Mm-hmm. But now the work <laughs> starts, right? I would assume that you guys um, have been laying the groundwork of trying to figure out how to get everything laid out once you got approved and ready to get up and going. So we, we got approved for charter school and just because of my ignorance, lay out for me kind of, um, and this is going to be a specialized school, lay out for me, are we uh, from a traditional um, K through 12? Or are we just uh, focused on primary uh, um, uh, grade school type age? H- how does that lay out within this program? ACE is K through five currently. Um, we hope to add a grade uh, each year after year three. But because we're the setup will be very different in the classrooms and throughout our school, we want to ensure the stability and um, that all of our staff are comfortable with the process of ACE. It, it will look very different in these classrooms than what traditional school has currently. So we have to do a lot of professional development. Our teachers will actually have three weeks of, of professional development in July. So how many teachers do you guys already have? We don't have any yet. We did. Okay. We could not start that process until authorization happened. Okay, so, But we've had several contact us and want to know what the process is. So we're looking forward to taking their resumes and, and moving forward with hiring. Um, we are contracting um, ABA therapy, which is applied mm-hmm. behavior analysis. Mm-hmm. I got to meet her the other day. Uh, uh, I don't have her name off, but um, I think she might be the owner. Who, who are y'all working with? That we're working with Ben Nicholson. Okay, maybe a different, maybe a different, Could be, a bit, different a bit. place. Currently, well, tell me a little bit about them and what they're going to do for. Well, currently in the school system, they don't have ABA therapy. In the integrated into the classrooms, which is really needed. Uh, so parents go and pick their children up during the academic day, noon or so, or they arrive late um, so that they can get this intervention. And it's, it's so valuable, but it would be more valuable in real time in the classroom. And that's what we're modeling. So it's, uh, mm-hmm. and you guys, please correct me if I misspeak here. It's my understanding that the Washita Parish school system has a department that specializes in um, kids with um, 
that are not learning at the same pace or have special needs uh, when it comes to learning. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also under the understanding that there's been times where specialized services have been allowed to come in, but sometimes it's school specific or it seems to me we have a very big deficit within the public school system in addressing specific needs for kids with different learning capacities. Is, is that a fair statement? That's a fair so statement. So there's, a, there's a, de a, a deficit there in that area, right? Yes, yes. Because if it was perfect, you guys would not be trying to create something. Exactly. Not to pick on them too much, but when, when you have a parent that has needs for a child and the public can't serve that need, how are ch children getting educated? They're not. To be quite honest, they're not. It's very difficult to sit here and just, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody. And sure. we, will, we actually are, will be in Monroe City. So it is the parish in the city and the parishes surrounding us. Um, it is difficult to sit here and, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but the law says, IDEA, 15, Bulletin 1508, says you need you have to serve the needs of the child, of what those needs are. And having those therapies, having that intervention embedded into their classroom, I, I, we can't figure out why we figured it out, but they can't figure it out. And it's such a help to the teacher. The teacher can teach. The parents can do their job. And then the behavior therapist helps with the behavioral interventions to keep kids focused, to have them be able to not have a meltdown with their triggers. And honestly, um, Ben Nicholson with uh, Pediatric Autism Center here in Monroe, um, Ben has been doing this for a very long time, and he knows how, um, has worked with us from the beginning, and knows how what our setup will be and he's going to help us with things like you have a lopers in the autism world you have kids that can be out a door quick how to set that room up so you're not blocking the door but you're you're encouraging a flow of movement around the room that they're not looking to go out the door so there are a lot of things that go into it, and it takes time. Sure. So it's taken us two and a half years, almost three years, to get this model secured. But we would love to be a resource to the parish. We would love to be a resource to Monroe City. We take ninety. We can take ninety six kids. Okay. We can take. What's that application process like to determine? Let's say we've got two hundred people. Um, I know the need is great. We, we yes. all know the need is great. How, what determines what kids are eligible versus not eligible to attend the school? Because you have limited space. Right. It's a lottery process. Okay. To keep it fair, it's a lottery. So once a, a child uh, gets in the school, they're able to continue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Once and then when in, openings come available, there will be an enrollment period, and then it'll be a lottery system. Is what correct. you're saying? That's yes. Correct. That's I think that's really the only equitable way to make something it like is. that happen. Absolutely. Um, so we know that there's a the need is great. Mm -hmm. um, being able to specialize is going to be able to to target what that child needs more effectively, right? And uh, uh, probably speed up that learning process because we have tools in place that are geared and catered towards that child's needs. What do you say to the um, to the parent or the community member that says, "Well, you're you're pulling them out of the public environment. They're not going to be able to socialize or be integrated in because they're now isolated with kids similar than what they are." What do you say to those parents, those community members? Say, "Well, we're you know we're not doing the best by them by pulling them out of that area." LRE least restrictive environment is individualized to each child. And I know the perception around it is they want them to be included into a general education classroom, but sometimes that's just not realistic, especially for kids on the spectrum. So their LRE is in an environment that's tailored to them with like peers. 
LRE. Tell me, tell me what you're talking about with that. What, what is that abbreviation? Least restrictive environment. Okay, least restrictive environment. So you think that um, as a mom with a child that you know has autism, you feel that uh, that dedicated uh, education that focuses on your child's needs is more beneficial for the long run than having maybe not adequate education, but you're trying to socialize that kid with other kids. And I mean, to me, it, well, it I'm, only makes sense. I mean, the path that you guys are going, but right. But that those are things I've heard question. before. Absolutely. And I want to just make get it out there and, and let you guys. As a mom, that was one thing that I've thought about too. But I've said from the very beginning, Ace has a family, and he comes home, and I have so many children in and out of my house, and they're constantly, "Hey, Ace," or if we go out, he goes with us. People will come up to him. So we go out in the community. We have friends over. He's around your neurotypical peers if you want to say that, and I'm not hiding him from anything. I simply want him to learn and to be as successful as he's capable of being. Sure. And at the end of the day, to know that he can know his ABCs or when he grows up that he might be able to identify going to the store in that process or just the simple things that we take for granted, eating different things or not being able to run out of the room. Right. Those are the things that I worry about. Not necessarily can he have a conversation with someone or can he tolerate being in the same room with someone that's neurotypical. Because you have to think, too, bullying is a big deal. Oh, yeah, I can. And not that my child in general would even understand that he was being bullied. Mm -hmm. I would. Yeah. And also, you know, because you brought up earlier, there is a wide spectrum. Mm -hmm. So um, ACE will have two programs, an academic program for children that are functioning at or near their grade level, and uh, one uh, essential program where they may be more impacted by their uh, autism. So these children in an academic program may have already been in a gen ed classroom. They're, these are their more like peers. They're, they're, they were in a general education classroom before. And in a general education classroom in a big school, you're talking about 25 kids yeah. in a classroom. To, for a kid that gets visually overwhelmed, auditorily overwhelmed, and that makes the learning so much more difficult for the kids that are with their neurotypical peers. So even in being what some people may consider their least restrictive environment sure. and they're integrated with their neurotypical peers. The learning part of that becomes so difficult. And I'm, I'm an advocate also for children with disabilities. And many meetings that I have been in, I've arrived because the, the word that comes down is they're, they're bad. Mm. They're, un, they're um, willingly disobedient. That's the biggest one right now, willingly disobedient. Well, they're not. It just comes down to, from, not. from what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, th they just don't know how to um, to handle the kid. The kid's not in the right environment. They don't, and that is, and it's so sad because um, professional development for teachers that are in the general education classroom on strategies mm -hmm. how to help kids on the spectrum would be, I mean, would make their life so much easier. Sure. I mean, that would just help so much. And I don't want to take anything away from our local teachers that are in a classroom that are there. Absolutely not. They, no, they are fabulous. Um, they are overwhelmed. Yes, overwhelmed is the right word for yes. it. They, they've got our classroom size continue to grow each year, it seems like. Mm -hmm. uh, the teachers have so much that's put on them uh, because of all the standardized testing that they have. And, and everything is based on the standardized test, which I'm. Um, I'm not pro non-testing kids uh, through our education system, but I think we put too much focus on trying to teach our kids to the test instead of educating them. And then you've got normal kids who learn at a normal pace within the, the school curriculum. Each one of them probably have different learning styles. So if that teacher is trying to take people who can consume the information um, the standard way it was taught and then to you roll in someone with special needs, that needs extra help i'm sure they're the last ones to probably get the help just because that teacher is just so 
uh, caught up in, I've got to do all of these things. I've got kids that necessarily don't respect, maybe have an administration that's not supporting me fully. And there's a lot of frustration comes in. So having this option for parents, I bet. So within our community, as you're talking with people, I cannot imagine you you don't have overwhelming support uh, for this. Uh, Anybody that does not support what you guys are doing, they just haven't taken the time to understand what's happening. So let's advance and talk about the physical location of the school. Do you have a physical location? We do. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. You know, where uh, Grace Episcopal Middle School was located on um, Glenmore and 6th Street. Is that where, like, um, the two-story type building is? That's actually the church. Okay. And so on the on the opposite corner was their middle school. Okay. It had a gym and uh, two buildings. Okay. And um, we will be located there. So we've started that process. Um, they've been so gracious and generous with us to allow us to you know, look at what we need to do to remodel and things that we need to do. Our first priority is really safety for our kids. Mm -hmm. So um, they let us kind of had free reign to know what to do and um, bring the architect in um, to look at it. They have. They've been wonderful. Fantastic. I mean, it's a, I can't imagine our community not getting behind you guys, but when we talk about funding, um, you get all three levels of funding, state, federal, and local. Mm -hmm. There's got to be startup cost to this that that's not going to come even close to covering. No. How are you guys getting funding to get this up off the ground? Because the state, federal, and local money is going to allow you all to survive, you know, the day-to-day. Correct. But just the equipment you guys are going to have, the material, the training for educators that's going to have to come into place, classroom setup. I mean, it, it's going to be an expensive process. I know that. What are you guys doing for funding right now to try to get this off the ground? Well, uh, we were gifted um, a generous donation from New Schools of Louisiana uh, through Kara Majori, and um, that is helping us at this point. Um, Kara is also connected um, under uh, the New Schools umbrella with a facilities uh, partnership, and they have been very involved with us. Uh, on a week-to-week basis now, mm-hmm. on getting our facilities, um, the drawings, all the things, the fire alarm system, all the things that have to happen Bring up for, the code. to code mm-hmm. and everything. The building has been sitting empty since twenty May of 2021. Okay. So, and there are just some Waiting different... Waiting for you guys the whole time, It, it right? has been. Waiting um, for you guys. I'm telling you, God opened that door for us. He really did. Mm-hmm. So, um That's where we're getting our startup money, and we will have a a kickoff fundraiser um, to bring in um, for special things that we want, different things that we want. We need a sensory room for kids to be able to go to when they need to have that input, or they need to go to a place where they can swing or climb if they're overstimulated. And uh, Maddie and I have lofty dreams. And so we want to provide even in their hallways little sensory pods so that they can just come outside their classroom and get uh, a little break um, right outside their classroom. So just different things that we want to provide at the not just a playground. We want a playground for them, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's a little bit different. So this podcast is possible because of your support of our real estate business. If you're looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, I'm confident we have the tools and the processes to help you reach your real estate goal. For more information or to reach out to us, check out the podcast description for our contact info. Just those things that we want to add on. Um, I told you that our teachers would have three weeks of professional development, and it takes those funds to be able to bring people in um, to share that professional development with them. So, I mean... We are being very wise with our money. Um, uh, First Baptist Church, Monroe, Mm -hmm. when they were exiting their building, um, we made a donation uh, to them and received um, a lot of desks, tables. Um, Miss June called us and said, whatever you need, this is what I have. And and please, we want this to go to uh, a place like yours. So we did. We had a lot of toddler chairs and tables and desks and um, teacher's desks. So the community has really come around us. And we we get phone calls a lot. What what can I do to help? Um, 
parents that have connections with construction companies, like, we'll help you with the demolition. Take that off your list. Take that off your facilities budget. We, we can do this. We, we can do it. We can at least do this part. So people that have um, skills or connections with other companies that can help us along, we've, we've been getting those phone calls. So one of the things that we're going to do for you guys is that we'll make sure um, that when we go live with this podcast that we're going to have um, contact information. Absolutely. How people can get in touch with you guys uh, because although – Funding is going to start flowing into you guys. The funding is never going to be enough. Oh, absolutely not. We're going to have to have community support Mm -hmm. to see this school really flourish um, and get on a path for long-term success. Uh, Fair statement? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we want to do our part to help help get the message out. So just make sure we have good contact information and um, uh, the uh, fundraisers that you guys may be thinking about putting on. Or if we just have some listeners just want to, be generous and donate we via can. one check to take care of you for 10 years. We're open to take that too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a, a blessing? I, it would be, and I think it's it's not unheard of uh, for things like that, blessings to happen. Before we close, let's talk about, we touched on it a little bit, but let's talk about some um, some other misbeliefs that are out there. You know, the, the first one we discussed that, you know, uh, a, a child on the spectrum needs to stay in with, with other kids so they can socialize. What are some other things that you would like either the community or uh, parents with autistic children that are on the spectrum, what would you want them to know? I, I want them to know that this program is fully vetted by B- Bessie and by the Department of Education. And within our process, we had to choose challenging and rigorous curriculum. Currently in most classrooms that are self-contained for kids with disabilities, not just kids with with autism, but kids with disability, they only, they have access, it's required by law that they have access to top rigorous curriculum, but really what they get on a daily basis is um, a supplemental program. And at ACE, how we have planned this is that that top tier curriculum, just like um, Maddie's children get CKLA in um, for their uh, English language arts. They get it in their general education classroom. Our ki- our kids that are more impacted will also get CKLA. It may be broken down to their ability, but they're going to hear the same things. We will use supplements. Obviously, we will use supplements to to scaffold them to support them, but they're going to get that same curriculum. They're going to hear those things. They hear everything at your house. Mm-hmm. They have air, they hear things in the grocery store. They hear stories on the television. Why not in their classroom? I agree. And so that was one thing that we were just staunch about um, when we developed the program, that they may not be able to have the rigorous um, layout that someone in general education does, but they we can pick and, you know, break that down and scaffold it back up for them. But they are accessing it. But they are accessing it every day, not just they have access to it. Right. Which is a big difference. And it's a big difference. And I don't think parents understand that have kids that are in self-contained, that their children should have access on a daily basis to that rigorous curriculum. I'm not saying that the supplemental curriculum sure. is yeah, not, yeah, no, not challenging, but this is a curriculum they should be exposed to every day. And that'll be more in our essential academic program. Yeah. Our academic program with your more near near grade, near grade level. level, they will be accessing tier one every single day. Just like to they the, were in general to the edu- fullest. Mm-hmm. Just like general education. Now will this school have any type of partnership with uh, Monroe City School System or Washtenaw Parish School System? Is there any any interaction between the two? Not at this time. Okay. Um we hope that, like I said, we want to be a resource for sure. them um, because only taking 96 kids mm-hmm. is is limiting, and mm-hmm. there are more kids out there that need this type of intervention. I did have a um, principal call me, contact me, and he was very open and honest with me, and he said, I have some children in our program, and he said, um, I would really like for you guys to be a resource to us. And he said, would you be open to that? And I said, absolutely. 
Fantastic. I mean, I, I was blown away by him. I mean, I've never met him. And so um, he said, we really want to be able to serve the kids in our, in our area appropriately. We have to give a huge shout out to Mayor Friday Ellis. He has been in our corner since the beginning also. He actually went with us the day we visited the Emerge in Baton Rouge. He went with us. And so we kind of had him captive in the car with us. <laughs> and we took advantage of that to, you know, tell him what we wanted to do. And he went with us and he asked questions. And he has supported us every step of the way. Wow. So we've had several meetings with him. He was at Bessie he that day, and he stayed day. the entire day until the until the vote was in. And that's fantastic. So I have to give I have to give him a lot of props. He and Ashley are huge educational supporters. They are, and he wants to see this flourish, not only for our community, mm -hmm. but for the parishes that for families and parishes outside our community that that may need to bring their children. Yeah, in. And that's it's, I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on this. This is not just a Washita parish thing. Mm -hmm. If we've got any child that can uh, within Northeast Louisiana, when you guys open enrollment, you guys are open. I mean, everybody's We're welcome. basically open to the state. So you just have to be able, I mean, it's not going to be practical someone. Right, if somebody lives but if three they, hours away. But, but if they can get their child to and from school every day, every day. They, they can apply for this yeah, as well. Absolutely. Well, someone may have a grandmother that lives up here. Sure. Or aunts and uncles. Or there are a lot of different scenarios. So we are open statewide, but we realize it's basically the parishes that touch Washita. So another question I have uh, while we're still on... Um, when you guys went and, and looked at and visited all these schools, mm -hmm. I'm sure you got to see schools at different levels. Some are probably doing a little better than others, but everybody's striving for greatness. Mm -hmm. What are some of the successes that um, they were able to share with you um, of what the school has done to impact these kids? When we went to Arizona, um, we saw a program that had flourished. She started small like we did in, in uh, K through five, and she's grown over the years to middle school and high school. She now has a program for kids that are after they graduate for um, training for a career, you know, and getting them out in the public. You have kids that go on to college. You have kids that go on to um we met uh, a young man in New Orleans at the Chartwell School, which is a, a private uh, mm -hmm. school for autism, and um, he screen prints. He's, a, he's oh, an gosh. artist, and he screen prints, and his, his little small business has flourished over the years. So he, has, he needs some guidance, and he needs help with that, but he's the creative mind. So he's gone on to be productive in, in, in his community. And as a parent, isn't that what we want for all of our kids? Absolutely. We sure. just we just want them to be able to um, live life to the fullest. And for uh, each kid, the fullest is going to be different. Absolutely. Um, I was uh, had the pleasure of speaking uh, to a class, two classrooms of high school students this past week, and um, you know one of the things I tried to instill within them is about success. Success for everybody is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Don't chase someone else's success. You look at what success looks like to you, and mm -hmm. for a child that's on the spectrum, that success is going to be different for each child. But knowing that they have an opportunity to learn in a way that they can express themselves without getting uh, the frustrations that they have, because they now have training um, to be able to cope and to be able to deal with things, the, their success is uh, more probable today than it was before you guys started. So. Mm -hmm. You're right. It is. At the Chartwell School when we were there, it's on magazine. And you know how busy. Oh, that's, you know that's how, a beautiful place, magazine. But, yeah. but you know how busy magazine mm -hmm. is. And they take they take their students out to the community. And to me, that was a, another success. They take their, they walk them, you know, around in the community and have them go to the store, the market that's just down the street. I think it's two blocks away. Mm -hmm. They have them go to the park and navigate crossing streets. Um for some kids, it's the functional skills, everyday life successes that we've been able to see. And then other cases, we were able to see, you know, I hear the stories of kids that had gone on to college and um, or work in the workforce. So it does look different for every 
um, family for every child. And um, just like for neurotypicals, I mean, it, it's the same thing. But for kids on the spectrum, sometimes it's just, it takes a longer period of time to navigate that. Well, I think locally we have a great education system. We have a lot of great educators. And now I know that we're continuing to grow in our education mm-hmm. and offerings for our community. Um, and that's the whole reason I started this podcast. I want people to be able to see what I see in our community, mm-hmm. and that's a community that loves one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure, we have the things that we don't necessarily all like to talk about or see. Most communities have that. But we're a community that's trying to move forward and invest in people and have a great quality of life. And I'm grateful that you guys are uh, stepping up to the plate to just, just push us that much further down the road. Well, I'm, uh, I'm very thankful I live in a community that has uh, two people that has a vision that want to help. And I'm sure it took more than just the two of y'all to get this across the finish line. Absolutely. But, but you were the guys that are in the front charging forward. And um, I think this is so great for our community. And hopefully not only will you guys be able to flourish, but I'm, I hope that what you guys are doing could be an inspiration to others, whether it's in our community or outside our community, Mm -hmm. that say, we can't sit back and expect politicians to solve our problems for us. As a community, we can take action and make our community better. So it just takes people like you guys to say, put your yes on the table and say, I want my community to be better. Because you're not just thinking about ACE, you're thinking about the next ace that's out there, all the other aces that are out there. that all the other families that may not have had the resources or the people in their lives that have helped them, like I've had the help along the way. And I'm pretty sure there's probably people that just don't realize the resources that are available they for don't. them. And so so I, many. I think that this is a, a good start for you guys getting your communication out there. Mm-hmm. We want to come alongside y'all, so anytime you mm-hmm. have any updates or anything or in it, when you get ready to open, if we want to do this again, you talk about the progress that we've made, uh, you count on us in. We're, we're going to come alongside you guys and uh, do our part to try to help communicate and ensure y'all success. So thank you all for your commitment to thank our community so and uh, just to the kids of Northeast Louisiana. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, it. really. It means a lot. Yeah, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for taking the time to watch or listen to this podcast. We really appreciate your involvement please leave us a comment or even better yet, subscribe to this podcast and hit that notification bell so that you can be alerted for every new episode when it hits. 